this presentation is a little bit more theoretical because it speaks about uh, least squares assumptions. Actually, we want to answer the question, how do we know if you have good or bad model? And actually, what kind of a data we need to have in order to develop a good model? These assumptions are actually telling us what we are expecting in the entire population. First assumption is that conditional distribution of ui given by x high has mean zero. What it actually means that for any given value of x, distribution of residuals for that value of x on average is zero. For example, if we have we have a lot of different values for x, but for example, for one value, for example, five, we have let's say 60 observations. So every of these 60 observations has a residual. On average, these residuals need to be zero. This is shorter expression in, in comparison with the previous one. Graphically, it looks like this. For example, on our example of student-teacher ratio and test scores, for 15 student-teacher ratio, 15 students per one teacher, we have a distribution of the residuals. For in, in several districts, we have different values for the same size of the class. Somewhere, some, sometimes it is above our linear model and sometimes it is below our linear model. So residuals are actually differences between original data and the linear model, as we already said that. On average, we are expecting that they have normal distribution and that on average their value, their expected value is zero. We are also expecting the similar variations and similar distributions for all values of x uh, when it comes to our residuals, but it is different property and we will talk about it later on. So what is happening if we don't have this case? For example, if this curve is uh, maybe here or maybe there, or it is skewed to the left or to the right, then we will get biased and inconsistent estimates of beta 0 and beta 1. So our estimates beta 0 hat and beta, zero, beta 1 hat will be biased and inconsistent. In other way, uh, saying that, that our model will be uh, bad, it won't be good enough. Also, what we are expecting, if we have a distribution, expected value of residuals uh, zero, we are expecting actually the correlation between uh, independent variable and residual is actually zero. That there is not no any connection, any relationship between these two values. Uh, what we must uh, know that it doesn't work the other way around. It doesn't mean uh, for us, it means if we have the expected value of zero for residuals, that correlation will be zero. But it doesn't happen every time that if we have correlation that is zero, that expected values of, of residuals will be, will be zero. Also, if correlation is different from zero, we cannot expect every time that we will have uh, the, our residuals will be, uh, expected value of residuals will be different for zero. So, it is more theoretical. This, this part here is actually important for us. Second property, the second assumption is that every pair of our independent and dependent variable, variable must be independently and identically distributed, IID. We actually need a random draw for big population. We know in advance that these values are given and this is random variable, but all these pairs must be randomly distributed. What it means, I will show you on the example. For example, we have four different organic weeding methods from X1 to X4. We want to answer the question, how does tomato production depend upon the weeding method? We will run an experiment. Let's say that we have four plots of land, and if we always try to experiment with the x1 weeding method on the same plot and the, with x2 method on the same plot again, 
we will not have identically the penalty distributed data. We need to shuffle. In one run, we will put distribution like this. In second run, x1 will be in some other plot, x4 will be some other plot, and, y, and, and so on. So we will maybe run this experiment for 20 times. And on those 20 times, we need to shuffle, we need to change the position of these weeding methods in different plots of land so that every weeding method is, is uh, implemented in every of these four plots of land. Because under the surface, maybe this plot of land is different in comparison with the others. And if we want to uh, achieve the randomization, the independently identically distributed data, we need to do that. We need to run the randomization. If we don't have that, the errors will be correlated. Third assumption is about our outliers. Our large outliers are unlikely. So this is an example of the outlier. So it is extremely different value in comparison with the other values in the data set. Extremely large or extremely small, but anyway, very different because of some reason from the other data that we have. If we have something like that, we will uh, not achieve consistency of our, our data. So if large outliers are unlikely, if we don't have them, it will make consistency hold and, now, and it will allow us to use normal approximation because with this situation here, we will have some skewness. If we won't get, we will not achieve uh, normalization, normal distribution of our data. What we actually want to achieve is that our variance in the our sample is uh, going towards the variance, the true variance in the population as n goes to infinity. As we are uh, increasing our sample, we are expecting that we will be closer and closer to the true variance in the population. And we can achieve that only if we know that we have normally distributed residuals and that we don't have some strange variation in our data. In other words, if we don't have any outliers. So these are three main assumptions about ordinary least squares that we expect to be satisfied in order to develop a good model. Let's talk about a little bit more about sampling distributions of OLS estimators. It means about beta one and beta two hat, beta zero hat, sorry. So this is formula for beta one hat that you already saw. Let's make a change. Uh, Xi will be actually representing this part here in our equation and Yi will represent this a part uh, related to the independent variable yi. So let me say at the beginning that we know that for any given value of x, we will get different values of yi. So in population, for example, in our class size example, for the same value of the class size, student-teacher ratio, we will get different values of yi. So xi is given value known in advance, and yi is a random variable that we don't know in advance. If we make the change, we will from this formula get to this formula here. Again, we can change xi through xi square with a constant ai, because we know this value, these are given values. yi, I'm reminding you, is a random value. So we can express beta 1 hat as this formula here, constant times a random variable yi. We know if we multiply constant with the random variable that we will again uh, obtain on the left hand side random variable. So this is the proof actually that uh, we know if yi is a random variable, Therefore, beta 1 hat is also a random variable that uh, it goes according to some theoretical distribution. In our case, it is normal distribution that we are expecting. So if yi has a normal distribution, then beta 1 hat is also normal. It means that it is always advice, uh, advice for you at the beginning of the developing the model to check the distribution of yi. Anyway, 
If yi has some other distribution, it is complicated in small samples, then we will have a problem with beta 1 hat. But if is the sample is large enough, beta 1 hat will be normal anyway. What is a big sample, large sample? Uh, the rule of thumb is that uh, you have at least 100 data units to, to uh, consider it as a large sample. This is actually the implementation of the law of the large numbers. Let's talk a bit more. Let's talk about a little bit more about the sampling distribution of our estimates. So we are expecting that uh, our um, value of estimate beta zero hat in our sample is actually going towards true value of beta zero in the population. We also are expecting from our beta one hat from our slope. But if xi and ui are correlated so one of the assumption is, assumptions is not satisfied then we will have some kind of a bias we will not be on the true value of beta 0 and beta 1 in the population because it will be moved to the left or to the right the distribution of our beta 0 hat or beta 1 hat and we won't have the true value of beta 1 we will not catch the true value of beta zero and beta one in the population. If n is large enough, approximately, let's say, equal or more than 100, the normal approximation holds. We will, we will achieve the normal approximation. What it means actually, that beta one hat will have normal distribution with average value of beta one, expected value in the population, and with its variance. This is formula for variance. And this is also an explanation for beta zero hat that it also has normal distribution if, if we have normal approximation. What is happening when the sample is increasing? There is illustration. Uh, if we have small sample, smaller sample, the vari variation will be larger. This is this red curve here. So we will catch more values around true values of, of uh, true beta in, in population. But as our sample is growing and increasing in size, in numbers, then variation of our distribution of beta zero and beta one hat will be narrower and narrower, we will be much more on the true value of beta in the population. So it is advisable to have uh, large samples in order to reduce the variation of distribution of your estimates in your sample. This is the end of this presentation.